Hi everyone and welcome back to the uh, Metaphysics of Mind and we are exploring substance dualism at the moment and we've looked already at one of Descartes' arguments. Today is all about the conceivability argument. So we are aware from last like the last lecture, that Descartes came up with two arguments for substance dualism, and you need to know them both. So last time we looked at the divisibility argument, which is pretty much my mind is not divisible, but my body is. So these two substances must be different and distinct. And we looked at whether we looked at some of the problems with that, which involve whether actually our mind is um, indivisible. Can we break it down? Maybe it is divisible. And we looked at a quite a weak argument that was sort of saying, is all that is physical divisible? So we're saying, is there really a difference between mind and body? That's what we were doing last time. So that leads us on to Descartes' second argument, the conceivability argument. Okay, so there are different types of conceivability. Okay, so what makes something conceivable? We have different types. So is something logically conceivable? Well, to be logically conceivable, can it be done in any world? Okay, so can I conceive of a ball that is red all over and black too? No. So it's logically impossible to conceive um, in any world. And that's a logic, logically inconceivable. What about physical conceivability? Well, that's considering our world and the laws of nature that we have here in our universe. Is it physically conceivable? Can I conceive that pigs might fly? No, I can't. It's physically inconceivable. Right, so that leads us to this last type of uh, conceivability, which we call metaphysical conceivability. And this is saying, could there be a universe in which this is possible? It might not be possible here, it might be, but is there a universe in which it could be? So is it conceivable that I could be called Stan in another universe? And yeah, I could be. It's not logically impossible, is it? for me to be called Stan. The fact is, I'm called Sam. Okay, and it's really this metaphysical conceivability that is the one that Descartes is looking at here. So let's think then. Descartes and his conceivability argument. He's asking us whether there is anything inconceivable in considering mind and body as separate things. And his answer is, no, there's nothing inconceivable about that at all. The idea of the mind and body being separate and distinct is possible. So I know that this has got a lot of writing on this slide, but I, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to show you on the left the bit of Meditation 6 that this argument comes from. So I thought we could have a read of that first. And then we can see how the argument runs on the right hand side. OK, so you will know some of this. Um, you'll be able to recall it from epistemology. I'm certainly hoping you can. So let's have a look and a read. This is Descartes. So first, I know that if I have a clear and distinct thought of something, God could have created it in a way that exactly corresponds to my thought. So the fact that I can clearly and distinctly think of one thing apart from another assures me that the two things are distinct from one another. That is, that the two, since they can be separated by God, never mind how they could be separated, that does not affect the judgment that they are distinct. Here we go now, ready? So my mind is a distinct thing from my body. Furthermore, my mind is me for the following reason. I know that I exist and that nothing else belongs to my nature or essence except that I am a thinking thing. From this it follows that my essence consists solely in me, in my 
being a thinking thing. Even though there may be a body that is very closely joined to me, I have a vivid and clear idea of myself as something that thinks and isn't extended, and one of a body as something that is extended and does not think. So it is certain that I am really distinct from my body and can exist without it. Okay, so we're picking up on a few things that we've studied in epistemology. I want you to think back to clear and distinct ideas from Descartes and having these ideas that are indubitable, cannot be doubted. And he's got some going on here at the moment. Okay, now I'm hoping that what we're seeing here, that I am a thinking thing, um, we've got the cogito. Um, so he knows beyond anything else that he is a thinking thing. OK, he might have a, a body, um, but he knows that the, he is the thinking, the thinking part, the mind. OK, so we've got all of these things going on in this section. So we've also got um, reminders of the divisibility argument as well. So let's have a look at how this argument runs then. So premise one, if I can clearly and distinctly conceive of the essential natures of two things separately, it must be metaphysically possible to separate them. I clearly and distinctly perceive myself, my mind, to be essentially a thinking and unextended thing. I clearly and distinctly perceive my body to be essentially an extended and unthinking thing. Therefore, it must be metaphysically possible for mind and body to be separated, meaning that they are distinct substances. And therefore, substance dualism is correct. OK, then, so that's Descartes' conceivability argument for substance dualism. And you've got to know a series of objections um, against this, this argument. So let's look at this one, first of all. So what is conceivable may not be metaphysically possible. OK. OK, the gist of this objection is this. Thinking is one thing and actually being is another. Just because I can conceive of my mind being separate to my body, it doesn't mean it is. It could be that introspection, when I'm thinking, when I'm looking inwards at myself and I'm just aware of a mind, it could be that this introspection isn't an accurate way of really knowing the relationship between mind and body. Perhaps we just can't access knowledge of the body in the same way as we can the mind. So the gist, just because I can conceive of my mind being separate to my body, doesn't mean it actually is separate to my body. So in order to, to explain this, we've got somebody called Arnold. OK, Arnold objected to Descartes um, and he gave this example of Pythagoras theorem. Now, I'm sure you've come across this. A GCSE maths. OK, so um, we've got the idea with Pythagoras theorem that actually the area of C is actually equal to the area of B plus A. OK, but Arnold is sort of saying that we might not, we might not be aware of that. We might not be aware that that is the case, but that is the case. 
So let's give this a read. Arnold like, argues that we can liken Descartes' position to someone who is unaware of Pythagoras' theorem and the fact that the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the square of both the other sides. Just because they think about something in a certain way does not make that something the case. So just because we can conceive of two things being separate doesn't actually mean they are. In fact, they might share properties. So this person might have no idea that the square of C is equal to the square of B. But that doesn't make it the case. OK, it doesn't make it not the case. So her knowledge should not reflect on the actual situation. So Arnold is actually pointing out what's become known as a type of masked man fallacy. So this way of arguing. Just have a look at this, this idea then. Suppose I believe, rightly, that the masked man has robbed the bank. So I believe that. I also believe that my father has not robbed the, the bank. So I believe that as well. Mm -hmm. So therefore I conclude that my father is not the masked man. So I, just because I believe these two things are separate, I'm concluding that they are separate. But can you see that it's a bit dodgy to really move from what you believe to what is actually the case. You might be wrong. So um, this is the way it works then in the conceivability argument. I conceive of myself as a mind, a distinct substance. I do not conceive of myself as a body. Therefore, for my mind is not my body. And dualism is correct. But we're sort of saying maybe this is not you know what you conceive is not a good guide to what is actually the case right then so Descartes does have a response to this and he's saying I'm not talking about any ideas that I'm having just you know ideas about this or that my argument is not just about having ideas about the mind and the body and the way they are and the way they fit together my argument is about clear and distinct ideas. I have a clear and distinct idea that my mind is a thinking thing and doesn't rely on the body. And I have an idea that the body is not essential to my nature. These are clear and distinct ideas. And do you remember from epistemology, this makes them, you know, undoubtable. OK, so he thinks that he has established dualism in quite a certain way. Because he's based this idea, sorry, this argument on clear and distinct, indubitable um, knowledge claims. Right then, let's move on to another objection. The mind without body is not actually conceivable. OK, so can we conceive of a mind without a body, realistically? Well, there's lots of different points that we could come up um, and look at here. So look at neuroscience, for example, suggests that our mental life depends on our brains. You know, we have brain damage and it affects our minds, it affects our memory. Um, brain de degeneration can cause memory loss. We know how much the mind depends on the brain. Um, okay, so can we really think of mind as distinct from the body? Big question marks from neuroscience. Um, what about this? Yeah, uh, how do we recognise others? We identify them with their physical appearance, don't we? We, we think of them as, we, we identify them as bodies. So actually, my mind is part of who I am, but you recognise me through my body. If I turned up next week in a different body, would you think it was me? Okay, so are minds really distinct from the bodies when actually you identify me through my physical appearance? 
Okay, that one you can have a read off if you want, but it's not that crucial. This is an interesting point. So Hume, Hume actually takes it further. He's saying, actually, do we ever really identify with a mind? Okay, so there's Descartes saying, we know we are our minds. We are a mind. We are a thinking thing. But Hume's saying, like, there is no unity. Um, we don't have a conception of the mind. We only have sensations. We only have these thoughts. Um, and actually, a mind uh, it makes little sense to David Hume. All we seem to have are many thoughts or clusters of thoughts. Okay, right. So here you can do a bit of a match up. But I think one of the key points that you could use here is the evidence from neuroscience that actually our minds are very much dependent and uh, connected with our brains, our bodies. OK, and finally, then, today, let's have a look at this. What is metaphysically possible? tells us nothing about the actual world. So this is sort of saying, Descartes, you can talk about what's metaphysically possible, but it doesn't really get us anywhere. So, okay, Descartes is saying there's nothing impossible in thinking that minds and bodies are separate. So dualism might be right. But also think about this. It's also conceivable, isn't it? that there is only a physical thing, the body, and that the mind is actually part of that body. That's also metaphysically possible. Okay, so we might also make the point here that dualism might be conceivable, but so is physicalism, the competing explanation. It seems that there is a competing idea that is also metaphysically possible. The consciousness is the product of the physical brain. This criticism is making us look at the idea that even though an idea is conceivable, it doesn't necessarily mean anything in reality, and it's actually not giving any more weight to substance dualism than we could give to physicalism. So we're saying, OK, it's metaphysically possible, but so is physicalism. So really, the scales are equally balanced. We've got substance dualism, metaphysically possible. And we've got physicalism. So these theories that say the mind is just material. It's just um, some kind of behavior or some kind of brain state. So that's credible. That's credible. So conceivability does nothing to make substance dualism a more credible theory of mind. OK, so that, that's it on substance dualism for the actual argument. So you can see we've got two main arguments. And these are both from Descartes. So Descartes, Descartes. Divisibility, conceivability. And just a little summary there. My mind, according, this is the divisibility argument. My mind is not divisible, but my body is. And according to Leibniz's law of indiscernibles, two things don't share all the same properties, then they're different things. Okay, so that was the gist of the argument from divisibility. And then we had the objections here that you need to be aware of. And then today, conceivability argument. I can clearly and distinctly conceive of my mind as an unextended thing and of my body as an extended thing. Therefore, my mind and body must be distinct and separate and different. And we've looked at three different objections today. Okay, so next time we're going to venture into the world of physicalism.